Hello, I'm Lyra. I recently completed a living Pokedex challenge in Gen 2. I went from 0 Pokemon to 251. And it was a lot of fun. So much fun, in fact, I made a website to help you complete your own living decks. And I recommend you do. On top of completing the Pokedex, I also made a series of videos about it. And this video right here will act as a conclusion of sorts. I'm gonna look back at everything I did. Now, if you're going to start your own living decks, you can have a head start. Because I'm gonna tell you the mistakes I did and how to avoid them. So, here are the main lessons I've learned from the living decks. Now, the background footage you'll see is from the series itself, as well as some cut content. What the footage exactly is, you can see at all times, right here. First, and one that everybody knew about except me, you should use Crystal. It's just the best version. Where Pokemon Yellow was a bit different from Red and Blue, right? It was not a upgrade. Pokemon Crystal is a straight upgrade. It has better looks, unique Pokemon animations, locations have been upgraded, the caves are better designed. One of my main issues with Pokemon Gold and Silver is how the rare Pokemon were hard to find. Well, Crystal solved that issue. Mostly. And on top of that, there are way more options on how to tackle the living Pokedex. Now, if you don't have any attachment to any Gen 2 game, go for a Crystal right away. In my case, I had an attachment to Pokemon Silver. And even then, I should have considered Crystal more. I don't regret it, but if I had to do it again, I would definitely pick Crystal. Next, you should make your dream team as soon as possible. What I call a dream team is the team you'll use to do post-game content. The way I do it, it's composed of one beefy Pokemon you'll use for combat, uh, one or two catchers, uh, catching Pokemon. In my case, I used one catching Pokemon for every Pokemon, and then one special one for the roaming legendaries, because in Gen 2, they're kind of particular. I will come back to the roaming legendaries. There's a lot to say, but, you know, one or two catchers. And the rest of the team should be HM and TM experts. Now, you should do the team as soon as the first playthrough is finished. And if you know what team you want, you can actually start during your first playthrough. Uh, there's several ways to make the team, right? You, you're going to choose your favorite. That's the beauty of Pokemon. You can just choose your favorite Pokemon. But uh, you should think about it beforehand, not make the mistake I did of just starting with no idea of how you're going to approach it and then quickly realize I'm wasting time not being efficient. So make your dream team ASAP. Third, group tasks together. Stuff like trading, leveling, hagatching, all that stuff. It might not be technically faster, but it is a lot easier to keep track of if you group stuff together. Because setting up every task and having to jump back and forth between like a bunch of different things and doing all the PC management that comes with it, especially in Gen 2, can get really, really tiring. If you really, really want to mix things, like you want to play the game and then do the breeding or the friendship Pokemon at the same time, make sure to write down everything so you can very quickly come back to it and know where you're at. Okay, I need to evolve this Pokemon and then this Pokemon, attach this Pokemon, because you may not realize it, but it's a lot, a lot to keep track of. In a living Pokedex, you have a lot of balls to juggle. That's why I would still recommend try to group tasks together. It'll make it a lot easier to keep track of. And finally, you should really abuse other versions. I know it can be tempting to play as little versions as possible. If you want a Gen 2 Living Dex, if you want to be the most efficient, you could just play, I think it's like Crystal, Gold, and then Yellow or something. You can only play three versions if you want to. But the thing is, the more playthroughs you have across different cartridges, the more options you have. For example, I would very, very much recommend you catch Pokemon in another version if that Pokemon evolves past level 30, right? I think 30 should be the limit. Like, lower than that, they're easy to level up. Higher than that, you can do with the uh, XP boost help. Because if you get a Pokemon from a different trainer, you get a 50% XP increase. 
So I would recommend abusing that a lot. You're gonna do a lot of grind, so anything you can do to help that grind, go for it. You also get a lot of extra items, especially the ones uh, you get from trades. And on top of that, rare candies. Now, not every rare candy is quick and easy to get, but the one in Gen 2 that are, just make sure to get all of them, put them on, on the Pokemon you need to trade, and then trade them. Because it turns out, getting a lot of rare candies, even like just these rare candies, are going to nullify a lot of playtime. So, you know, not wanting to play one extra version. Well, if you do play that extra version and then you get a bunch of rare candies, it might not actually end up being that much more time in the grand scheme of things. And on top of that, you can use the money you get. Uh, in Gen 2, you can use the money for any item you want. Like, you know, if you need uh, some extra stuff, if you want to buy a Porygon in another version to keep your money to upgrade one specific Pokemon if you want. Or, or buy extra items, whatever you need, you can do that in Gen 2. And in Gen 1, you can use that extra money to buy a bunch of stones, which you are going to need. So playing more versions than the one that's strictly necessary is actually not that bad, and you should abuse that. Next, we're getting to the comments that are more targeted to my own Living Dex playthrough. I'm going to answer the most common comments and questions, as well as provide a bit of behind the scenes. Now, I am not the best Pokemon player. That is incredibly obvious the moment you watch any video. I made mistakes, but I also made very, very purposeful choices that I didn't explain in the videos because it would kind of break the flow and, you know, it's not necessarily the time or place to explain all that stuff. But there are things I made a conscious decision to do or not do something. Stuff like using Pokemon Stadium. It is the comment I got so many times. It, it is the most common recommendation on the Living Dex playthrough. And I very much appreciate it, by the way. I, I very much appreciate people taking time to explain, hey, you should have done this, you should have done this. Here's a few hints on how to play better. I absolutely appreciate it. But in the case of Pokemon Stadium, it was a conscious decision not to use it. I want to focus on the core games, right? The main series. And I always saw Pokemon Stadium as a spin-off. It's good to have, right? It's a good complement, but it's not mandatory. Know that Pokemon Stadium is very, very helpful for a living dex. You get way better PC management. You can get choice Pokemon or starters a lot easier than just restarting the game. And turns out one thing I did not know, you have a speed up mode, right? It's Doduo or Dodrio mode where you literally play the game faster, right? You speed up the game, which, you know, will decrease the time played. The problem, the main problem I have with Pokemon Stadium is that I don't like the combat in Pokemon games. It's obvious the moment you see me fight because I play terribly when it comes to combat. The thing is, Stadium is only combat, so that's not a great, uh, very appealing proposition for me. But again, know that it is a fantastic addition to a living dex and that there are ways, even if you're playing on emulator, to play with Pokemon Stadium. Which brings me to a very common question I got as well. What platform are you playing on? I am playing on emulator. The emulator itself is called VBAM. It is not perfect, it has some issues, and if you see some graphical weirdness, chances are it's coming from the emulator, but it does exactly what I need to record and stream the game. Uh, the reason I did not use original hardware was for money reasons. It's that simple. Now, that might be oversharing, but when I started the series, I was in very, very bad shape financially. I tried to play with uh, actual hardware for Gen 1, right? I had the N64, I had the transfer pack, I had Pokemon Stadium, and I had the cartridges, but the battery was not good. So I bought repro cartridges, right? Reproduction cartridges. And it didn't work. Turns out reproduction cartridges don't work with Pokemon Stadium. So I ended up selling my N64 with, you know, all my games, all my hardware, everything. And I sold it to buy food. Yeah, things were very, very dire. I was able to eat that month because I sold my N64. Thankfully, things are not as bad anymore. They got not bad during the Gen 2 living decks where the channel got a bit more popular, and that's thanks to you. Yeah, you, 
you watching. Thank you very much. And it's also thanks to every single patron that decides to finance this channel directly. Uh, I usually keep them for last, but it's the perfect time to mention every single patron. Thank you very much. Especially the ones in the highest tier. Calzini, Lucas Maximilian Leur, Jonas C, and Chris Lunders. Thank you, and thank you to everybody watching this video. Now, even though it's still not an issue, well, I started Gen 2 on emulator, so I kind of had to finish it on emulator. Also, one thing to consider is that I live in a PAL country. So if I wanted original hardware, I would need to purchase NTSC versions of it. So the price can quickly jump up. Now, here's one follow-up question. If I'm using an emulator, why not use the speed-up process? Well, because I'm playing on emulator out of necessity, not convenience. So even though I'm not playing on legit hardware, I try to be as legit and as close as possible to the original hardware as possible, which means uh, no cheating and no speeding up the game. I did end up cheating a bit, you know, but only for Celebi. That's the only time I ever cheated in the game. How do I trade on an emulator? Well, I need to use a very specific emulator called TGB Duo. It's very inconvenient and difficult to set up, but it works for Gen 1 and 2. Uh, that's also why, you may have noticed, there are uh, no in-game sound during the trading sessions, right, in the videos. Because the emulator is that primitive, the sound doesn't work if you have both games uh, plugged in. It's very glitchy. Finally, another comment I got is that there are better ways to level Pokemon than just grinding the Elite Four. And yeah, there are several ways. You can do like I did and grind the Elite Four. You can grind red. Uh, you can set up a mystery gift team with Chansey, right? Like you do a mystery gift with a bunch of Chansey and then every, like once a day, you can fight that team. And if you use the, um, if you change the time of day, then you can keep fighting again and again and again that team of Chansey, or you can grind the victory road. At the end of the day, um, the most important part of grinding is that you need to pick the way that works the most for you, because getting a living dex is a huge time commitment. If you choose a solution that you don't much like or care for, or like that's irritating or like inconvenient for you, then you're not gonna stick with it. Well, the most important aspect is not to pick the best grinding um, option, but just the one that feels the best for you. And that will help you stick with the challenge until the end. Now, let's get to the Living Dex journey proper, the Living Dex videos. Before we start, I need to go back to the prep video. There's a few comments I have there. Uh, at some point, I mentioned Misdreavus uh, when I talk about Dark Pokemon. It's not a mistake, I knew Misdreavus was not a dark Pokemon, it's just I wanted to mention all the Pokemon that I think are a bummer because they're very difficult to obtain. Turns out all of them were dark Pokemon except Misdreavus. It's on me, I didn't present it correctly, it's my fault. Also, here's a fun thing, the self-imposed rules of the challenge uh, mentioned always catching Pokemon instead of in-game trade. That rule was not respected because I actually traded to get a Rhydon, instead of getting a Rhyhorn and then evolving it. Another rule mentions always preferring catching to breeding, which clearly I did not respect with Porygon and Houndour. So I probably need to open up the rules a little bit more in the future for the subsequent uh, living dexes. Finally, at the end I mentioned we will obtain our trusty Vaporeon Arya. Uh, the goal was to get Arya, which which is the Vaporeon I usually get. Right? It's a female Vaporeon, because it's the best Pokemon, I mean, of course. The thing is, during the playthrough, the Vaporeon, like the best Vaporeon we got was from Crystal. It had really good stats. It was also a male, and breeding a female is difficult for Eevees. So I decided I'm just going to use that male Vaporeon, rename it, and then call it a day. Now, we start the journey with the fish video. I look fondly on this mistake, because it shows why I don't mind knowing everything, right? Every single aspect of the game before starting, right? You may be asking yourself, why don't you learn every single thing about the game to make the living decks as efficient as possible? 
Well, that's why. Because even as prepared as I was, I did not know how swarms work in detail and panicked, which made this really, really funny moment happen. Had I known a swarm is active until midnight, because this is how swarms work, once they're active, uh, they're active until midnight that day, uh, we would have avoided this really funny moment where I'm just acting like an idiot. So sometimes not knowing everything can lead to more fun in the long run. By the way, uh, Kurt gives you a free lure ball whenever you're done with the Azalea Town questline. It was used on the first Rammer Raid, and it opened immediately, like no wobble, nothing. Which is perfect, because that's the quality I expect from Kurt's balls. Also, while we're speaking about fish, the thumbnail for that video was created in five minutes. Like, it was really quick, because I had plans, so I had 15 minutes to make title, description, thumbnail, like, handle the playlist, monetization, like, everything about the video. So, I went with the first thing that popped into my mind. Fish, Remoraid, let's go. And uh, it worked out. <laughs> the same thing happened, actually, with the Catching Mechanics 2 thumbnail. This time it was not because of time constraints, but mostly because I was just dry creatively. So, I just looked at um, Nido King and went, yeah, let's put a heart behind them and uh, call it a day. These are perfect examples of what happens in my brain when I stop thinking. Really, really dumb things. Here's another thing, the name of the rival. Many people commented calling it question mark, question mark, question mark, either now or when they were a kid. And to be honest, I almost did. Uh, although I felt that joke was a bit on the nose, so I changed it to mark instead of question mark, question mark, question mark. But the spirit of the joke, I feel, remained. At some point, I don't show Lance attacking a Team Rocket Grunt. The reason for that is actually pretty silly. The emulation, at times, would just glitch out. The screen would turn to a bunch of glitchy textures. And it actually happened right after uh, Lance attacked the Team Rocket Grunt. So I decided, I didn't want to show that, because it's not a great look. So I decided, hey, you know what? Let's turn it into a really funny moment, and uh, yeah, have fun with it. And at the end of the video, uh, you know how I lost my mind trying to pronounce uh, opposing correctly? Well, apparently, I did not learn, because I made the exact same mistake in part 5 of the challenge. But the message displayed states the opposing Pokémon is affected. This time, I didn't correct it, because I wanted to see if people would notice. In the second part of the videos, we start the gold save file and play red and crystal. Now, here's a fun detail we've noticed on stream during the Pokemon Gold story. So also, what is, what is up with the dollar sign here? Faulkner wants some cash or is loaded or something? Why is his uh, gym a giant dollar sign? Now, a question I got when it comes to Pokemon Gold and Crystal is uh, if I could trade the Master Ball from those save files to catch the Legendary Beasts. Well, in the case of Crystal, I did not go further than a critique, so getting the Master Ball was out of the question. It also explains why I did not get Suicune, because I never got to the point where you could catch Suicune. And in the case of Gold, you may remember I actually used my Master Ball on Teddy Ursa. It was a terrible idea. Like, really bad. But I'm coming from Gen 4, right? Like, I spent a lot of time in Gen 4, and I've caught all six roaming legendaries, and it wasn't that big a deal, right? It was a fun time, actually. So I was convinced roaming legendaries were not going to be a problem uh, in Gen 2. How wrong I was. When it comes to red, uh, there have been a few comments mentioning how terrible I am in Gen 1, and how Venusaur with Lich Seed, Toxic, and Razor Leaf with Guaranteed Crits is one of the best Pokémon in the game. Well, for starters, yes, I am terrible at Pokémon Gen 1, right? If you watch the Living Dex, in the Gen 1 Living Dex, you can very much see how bad I am. I'm still learning anything Pokémon related. The thing is, and I probably did not make that clear during the video, my problem is not with Venusaur, right? Leech Seed, Toxic, Razor Leaf is a good moveset. 
the problems I had were with the level up experience. Because you learn a Razor Leaf at level 30, Toxic is a reward from Koga, which is in the Fuchsia City's gym, so not near the beginning of the game. And Lich Seed does not work that great in the early game because you don't have enough defense and HP to take the hits while your Lich Seed does its work. Now, once I evolved my Bulbasaur into Venusaur, I stopped having issues, but that's my point. The leveling experience is very difficult. Given I should have used Sleep Powder a lot more, but Bulbasaur and Ivysaur are not great Pokemon to start with. Now, you can comment that I'm not supposed to play with only one Pokemon. And uh, indeed, that's one of the beauties of Pokemon, is you get to make your team. But what I was trying to do is to see how difficult it would be with each different starter. And I only had issues using one Pokemon when I used Bulbasaur, when I picked Bulbasaur. Even if Venusaur might be significantly better in the endgame. And to be honest, I don't mind all that. I don't mind having issues with Bulbasaur because at the end of the day, it led to one of my absolute favorite moments in Gen 1. That champion fight with my Venusaur, even though it was played terribly, was really fun for me. And, you know, we've eventually prevailed. Uh, no excuse for Chikorita, though. Chikorita is really, really bad in uh, Gen 2. It's so bad, actually, Crystal made Growlithe accessible earlier in the game to give you a good Pokemon, right, a fire type, against the bug gym leader. Because else, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, between, like, the rival fight and the gym bug leader. Also, I skipped showing the Celebi event in Crystal, but that's because nothing really happens. Uh, I did the event in Hard Gold and Soul Silver, and it was great. It was fantastic. But it's not the same in Crystal. In, in Crystal, nothing happens. Like, you bring the, the GS ball to Kurt, you wait a day, because it, it works on the ball and whatever, then you go to Elex Forest, you get the Celebi encounter, and that's it. The only cool part about the event is how the trees in Elex Forest starts moving. Um, that's it. Funnily, uh, because I activated the event so early in the game, I had to catch Celebi with a Bayleaf and uh, throwing Great Balls and not even Ultra Balls. It did not actually take that long, which was surprising. Maybe I got lucky. Now, I don't actually hate Grass Starters. In general, I'm not an angry person. I don't get angry pretty much at all. I just think it makes for more fun content when I get worked up, where I, where I get really emotional, uh, like in the Pokemon Yellow video. So I tend to work a little bit of uh, anger into the script, but it, it's all surface level. I don't actually hate grass starters. If anything, I think Shikorita is one of the cutest Pokemon ever made. It is so, so cute. The next video is getting the Dream Team and starting the Capture Adventure. I had a lot of people giving me advice for the Dream Team name. But I like the original name, the Dream Team. It's bad, but that's because I didn't know I wanted a name for my Dream Team when I went in. Turns out it made the game more fun to name your Dream Team. I have another example of that, of like not knowing what to do at first leading to bad names, because my character in uh, the Gen 1 Living Dex was red, because the channel did not have a name yet, so I didn't know what to name, so I just went with the default one. When it comes to the Capture Adventure, a few people pointed out I could get a free shuckle in Sinewood. Right? An NPC just gives you a shuckle. Well, we are here to catch them all. So yeah, I could get a free shuckle, but you know what? It doesn't take long to catch one ourselves. So we're going to catch them all. We're going to catch a shuckle. It's all right. I knew it was available, but I'm not going to go for the easy way, right? We, we do this challenge because it's difficult, not because it's easy. And there we get to Ho-Oh. Which brings me to a couple of questions I was asked. Except for the legendaries, what was the hardest and most annoying Pokemon to get? Well, I'm gonna take this question as like two answers, like the hardest and the most annoying. The most annoying, it's probably a very predictable answer, right? It's a boring answer, but it's Tyranitar. Because I had to trade, you have to realize, I had to trade two Pokemon to gold, right? Surrender and Aqua, finish the story, which took me an hour and a half, catch a level 20 Larvitar, trade everything back, and then do the grind. Even with the XP boost, that was still significant. That was still a significant grind. It doesn't help that I believe Tyranitar is a very, very silly Pokemon. Like, the pseudo-legendaries 
are so silly. They appear near the end of the game at low level. Thankfully, they fixed it in Gen 2 for Dragonite, where you can catch a Dragonite fairly early in the game. You can catch it in Johto, and you can catch it at level 40. Uh, although, to catch it at level 40, you need to go to Kanto. But still, like, you have options. In the case of Larvitar, it's at the very end of the game, very last area, and it's at level 20. It's just dumb. Nobody's gonna use it for combat. It's only here to look cool, because they gotta have a pseudo-legendary, I guess. Now, the hardest Pokémon to catch was Ho-Oh, because we had to go up a full tower with nothing but Rattatas. There was no plot, no story. Well, I guess there's the lore, but like as far as the tower itself, there's not much to it. Uh, there are no trainers. Exploring the towers was actually kind of fun. And then we had half an hour of just throwing balls. Didn't even do any damage because Ho-Oh can heal. So I just threw balls for half an hour and just, just playing that roulette. Keep throwing balls and waiting to get the jackpot. Uh, it's hard to catch Ho-Oh because you just want to quit. Now, on the opposite, what Pokémon did I enjoy catching the most? As far as catching methods are concerned, Swarm is actually really, really fun. Now, I would increase the 1% chance to 5%, and it relies on getting one very specific Pokégear number. But if you know all that, it allows for the excitement of having a very rare Pokémon in one specific place. So if you find that rare Pokémon, like, you get excited. But if you don't get that rare Pokemon, you still have that excitement whenever you get that call of like, hey, it's a swarm, then you get an excitement even though you didn't get the rare encounters. In the playthrough itself, in the way I played the game, my favorite uh, Pokemon to catch is a toss-up between Chansey, right, actually, or Chansey, and uh, Lugia. Chansey, because that grinding moment, that moment I spent grinding for the three Chanseys I needed, uh, made me realize streaming the entire journey live to people was actually really fun. It made the grind not just grindy and, and like a bit miserable. It was actually a really fun thing and like catching that Chansey was actually really fun. I also enjoyed Lugia because of the heavy ball throw, right? The, the heavy ball catch was a fantastic brain over brawn moment. Catching the Pokemon was still random, but beforehand I had calculated that the heavy ball was better and it actually paid off. So using my brain turned out to be good. Now here's a little note. Before we got Crobat, we actually used level 2 Hoot Hoot for Fly, which I renamed Boing. Because Golbat cannot learn Fly. So we had to wait until we got Crobat, and then we could get rid of our level 2 Hoot Hoot, which is very, very small Pokemon. In the fourth part, we finished the Capture Adventure, and complete the Dream Team by replacing Croc. Which brings me to another comment I got. I could have used a better Pokemon for Elite Four rematches. Why go through the trouble of leveling Vaporeon? Well, I've mentioned it in the Gen 1 Living Dex, but this is where I made a decision, not because it was efficient or not, but because it adds personality. The fun part of Pokemon is choosing your Pokemon. And I wanted Vaporeon to be the team lead and to be the highest Pokémon I had. And so I did. The thing is, I couldn't do it in Gen 1. I tried, but I couldn't do it. So I decided, yeah, this time I'm gonna do it for real. I want Vaporeon to be the team leader. It took me more time because I had to level up that Vaporeon, start with a level 5 Eevee and level it up. But that's what made this playthrough my own, right? Like It's my playthrough because there's a Vaporeon as the team leader. Now, in part four, the Lapras moment, the reason for the save file to be in the wrong day was actually me messing with the, with the save file, having to move save files around as I was changing emulators to do the trade. So it ended up messing the time and day, so I fixed it at the end where I went back and used the code to change the time of day, but for Lapras, it was, funnily enough, just two days off. So I ended up catching Lapras on a Sunday. Also, I did trade for stones, right, trade with Gen 1, but one aspect I didn't show is that you have one stone of each type available in a Gen 2 game, and I did get those uh, stones. On Route 25, Bill's grandfather asks to see some Pokémon, and when you show these Pokémon, he gives you a stone in exchange. And uh, I did not show this in the final video, but it did allow me to get the final stone evolutions. Did you get a shiny through the journey? Nope. 
no shiny. Not only did I not get a shiny during this journey, I never ever caught a shiny ever, even playing casually. Not counting our red scaly friend, of course, that's, you know, mandatory. There is a slot machine in the Celadon game corner. You did not need to go to Goldenrod. Really? Well, let me check it out. So there's the cards, but apparently... There's actually just some normal slot machines right there. Oh. <laughs> ah! Ah! Alright. <laughs> okay, well... Uh, there were slot machines right there. I did not need to go to the other side of the world. Well, what do you know? <laughs> yeah, it was like just a few steps away. It's alright. Could not be closer to is literally the other side. Yeah, it's alright. It's fine. And now we reach the end. Starting with hatching, and here's a question I got. Why didn't you hatch eggs during the journey instead of all of them at once? First, it was way easier to keep track of in the guide and in the video footage. You have to remember, I'm trying to make videos out of this, and keeping track of where everything is can quickly become a mess when you have hours and hours of footage. Having to go back and forth between like breeding and the rest of the playthrough uh, would make it very difficult to keep track of everything and to remember, oh, when did I obtain this Pokemon? When did I obtain this egg? When did I hatch this egg? So you have to realize I'm very influenced by the fact that I'm making video content out of this. So I decided to do everything else and then to focus on eggs all at once. Also, it made for a very interesting streaming experience. The egg day we ended up having on stream was very fun. It was like a bit over four hours of just talking and, you know, talking about a bunch of Pokemon stuff and getting egg after egg after egg. So I'm very happy about that decision and I will certainly do it again in the future. Now, I have gotten a lot, lot of comments, mainly on the roaming legendaries. And I appreciate how passionate people are and how eager they are to share comments and tips and advice and like the way they did it. I, I'm very excited that there's there's so many ways to approach it and I've learned things reading those comments. Like thank you very much. If you took the time to just share like some advice you had or like the way you went for it, thank you very much for that. Now here's the thing. I made some purposeful decisions. First, the choice of Pokemon. The most important thing to consider is that Mean Look is useless. In Gen 2, a sleeping Pokemon cannot flee. So, using Mean Look on a sleeping Pokemon does nothing, and if you're using Mean Look, the Pokemon can still roar. Also, Ghost types don't prevent roar from working, even though it's a normal type move, because it's not a damaging move. Gengar was one of the most recommended Pokemon, but Hypnosis is only 60% accurate, and Mean Look, right, the fact that you have Mean Look and the Ghost type, don't serve any purpose. So basically you're just deciding, hey, I'm gonna have a fast Pokemon with Hypnosis, but why not have a fast Pokemon with a better uh, sleep move? I mean, you can still use any Pokemon you want, right? But having a fast Pokemon with a good sleep move is what I focused on. So Jumpluff is really cute. And uh, that was the main reason I picked Jumpluff. <laughs> also, I'm never ever going to use Smeargle ever because it's not a fun Pokemon to use. One of the fun parts of Pokemon is picking your team, picking your favorites, and pretty much you could use Smeargle in any case. Just get a Smeargle, teach him good moves, level him up, you're good. That doesn't sound like fun to me, so I, I won't ever use Smeargle ever. I like the design, uh, the, the Pokemon design, but as far as the gameplay goes, it's not a fun Pokemon. Now, another thing to consider is having several Pokemon to catch the legendary, right? Having several Pokemon for the job. The thing is, switching between Pokemon takes one turn, which brings me to my next point. A lot of you have commented how health stays the same between encounters. So why didn't I lower the health to, be, to have the roaming be low health once and for all? Well, it was brought up during the stream, and was actually, that conversation was included 
in the final video at some point, but I had so much stream footage I decided to cut it. But uh, here it is, uninterrupted. And again, you know, you're free to to do it however you want. Like, you know, that's that's the that's video games, right? Like, I don't want to be the, the like, oh, you know, if, if you want to do it another way, then you play it. But looking at the numbers, spending several turn turns not trying to catch while using moves that only increases the chance by 1.5 is too light for me. I, I don't like those those numbers. Because here, like, we're actually... It could be done right now. It's not. But, bam, that's the chance we take. And that's that's all we want. We want to take as many chances as possible. One of them is going to work. Oh, one of them could work! Basically, every turn we take that's not throwing a ball, it's as if we had thrown a ball with a 0% chance to catch. What we want is to take as many turns as possible to catch the Pokemon. We want to roll the dice as many times as possible because if we hit that jackpot, we're just done. It's That's it, we caught the Pokemon. Switching Pokemon and using extra moves, right? Using sleep and like lowering health, all that stuff. It is turns we are taking that are not actively trying to catch. It's very easy to get lost in the most, like, like the highest chance, right? Trying to get the highest chance to catch a Pokemon. But that highest chance might not be the fastest way to catch the Pokemon. If you take three hours to set everything perfectly and catch on your first try, and I take two hours with the not a great strategy, but I took as many chances as possible and I got lucky, well, I was still faster. It's not a black and white situation. There's, there's not one situation that's better than the other. You have to decide if you want to give you the, the biggest chances, even though it takes longer, or want to try your luck. I decided to try my luck. Also, lowering a Legendary's health is about a 1.5 chance increase. That's it. It's a 1.5% increase. And you have to take at least two turns to lower the health. And the Pokemon can wake up and flee. So you have to go through the whole process of encountering it again. At the end of the day, it's up to personal preference. I made my decision it might not be the best one, but it's the one I went for. There's no one single best way to do it. You know, you make a choice depending on your context. If you want to use Jinx with Lovely Kiss, that's great. That was also another Pokemon that was recommended. I mean, everybody deals with randomness differently. If people reacted to randomness, like, like random events the exact same way, casinos wouldn't exist. That's the purpose of casinos, is how do you deal personally with a random chance? Would you say that the roaming legendaries are so tedious to catch to the point of frustration that they're poorly designed? Or do you think it's a suitable challenge that makes finally getting the beasts exhilarating? Here's the thing. I love a challenge. I mean, that's why I'm here. But there's a thin line, right? There's a line between challenging and frustrating. That line, Gen 2 crossed. The concept of roaming Pokemon can be really fun, and I mean, subsequent gens proved that. I loved catching roaming legendaries in Pokemon Gen 4. The thing is, there's stuff in the challenge that happened I did not even mention. For example, at some point, I was on a route where I knew I checked in the Pokedex, the legendary Pokemon was there. So I kept going back and forth in the tall grass, getting encounter after encounter after encounter. Random Pokemon after random Pokemon after random Pokemon. I was not using the repel trick. And I kept checking, and the legendary was still there. I was just not encountering it. Because turns out, the encounter chance, even if you are on the exact same route, is pretty low. I forget what it is. I think it's 10%. I could be wrong, but... Stuff like that, I did not even mention. And, like, having to go into the Pokedex, and, like, you have to go to the page, and then go to zone every time. And the fact that Mean Look is completely useless. Like, there's a bunch of small elements that make it... More difficult, more difficult, you know, more challenging, more challenging, more challenging. But at some point, there's one element that's too much, right? It's the straw that breaks the camel's back, where it goes from challenging but fun to just frustrating. At the end of the day, the most important aspect is what feeling prevails. When you catch, when you finally have that capture, is it happiness or relief? 
In my case, I was happy to complete the living decks, but I was relieved beasts were over. And that's kind of not what you want to go for. So I think, yeah, to me, it's very close to being like a very difficult challenge that's fun, but it goes over the line and becomes just frustrating. So we now have our living decks. Did you know you can print your diploma? Yeah, they really, this gen, they really tried to make the Game Boy Printer a thing. Final fight against Red. Uh, the entire Dream Team was actually part of the, was here, right? But from the start, all I wanted was to get Aqua at level maximum and sweep the entire team. That was, from the start, that was my goal. I want Aqua to sweep Red. And uh, I did it. I couldn't do it in Gen 1, I did it in Gen 2. Of course, using our best friend, Money. So, in the end, what was your final playtime across all saves? Well, you can see right there the Gen 2 times. Of course, that's just like gameplay time, and sometimes I even let the, the console run, but uh, it also doesn't take into account all the work I did not playing the game and preparing for the challenge. But as far as just playtime is concerned, 78 hours and 49 minutes. Uh, if you look at the Gen 2 video times, uh, the first, the prep video, was released on April 19th, 2022. And this episode right there is releasing mid-October, which means, like, six months. Of course, it was not six months of playing Pokemon Gen 2, but six months of making video content for it. And uh, it goes even further if you count the very first day I started working on the Gen 2 Living Dex when I started working on the Gen 2 website, which was March 24th. So at that point, we're getting to pretty much seven months. Seven months of Gen 2. So as you can probably guess, I am done with Pokemon Gen 2. I'm done with Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal for a while. Now, the videos are not the best video content ever. There is still room for improvement, and I very much plan on improving on the videos in Gen 3. And uh, if you actually go back and watch the videos, you can see, you can actually find like gradual improvements for each video. But this series has allowed me to, to find my voice, right? Like the way I want to edit, the way I want to write scripts, the kind of content I want to make, all that stuff, as well as learn how to make and tell an interesting story, right? Tell a story that's not that exciting, but tell it in an interesting way. And hopefully you were able to follow along and find the Living Deck series interesting. And my goal from the start was to entertain the audience, the viewer, you. And uh, I very much tried to, to do that. That was my, my main goal, is just how can I make this challenge entertaining? So I genuinely hope I was able to do that and uh, if you're still here, thank you very much for, for following along, for, for you to care enough about the series to, to want to know everything, want to know as much as possible about it. Uh, thank you very much for the support, the comments, like everything. Trust me, I read as many comments as possible and I try to answer some of them, but you know, I, I can't answer all of them because I actually need to make video content. I can't spend all my time on YouTube. I actually need to edit videos and, and play the games, but know that I read pretty much every single comment. If you ever get a thumbs up out of nowhere, it's probably me. Anyway, I am done with Gen 2. I'm happy to be done with Gen 2. That series was so much fun. I wish you a fantastic day and hope to see you in Gen 3.